ಕರುಣಾರ್ಣವಮಾಯ್ ಕರುದಗ್ಗತಿ ನಲ್ಗು ಅರುಣಾಚಲ ಶಿವ ನಮಸ್ತೆ so this question came up on our private course discussion last night and i think it's a very important question because it specifically addresses the most common misunderstanding of people in the spiritual path today and that is that one can become enlightened simply through knowledge that's not how it works that's not how any of this works enlightenment is not something you can do rather <laughs> again we get the blessing of the goddess <laughs> she gives it when you become qualified and what does it mean to be qualified it means that your devotion and your good karma your destiny have reached maturity have reached perfection when you deserve it she gives it i try to understand we're living in this body and this body is run by kundalini shakti Do we beat our hearts? Do we digest our food? Do we breathe in the night when we're sleeping? No. She does all of this for us. Do we balance the endocrine system? Do we keep the brain cells firing and hook them up in the right ways? But no. We don't do any of that. We can't. that's not part of our scope yes some yogis can enlarge their power over the body by a, a small tiny amount but only the kundalini can make a whole new body you see and people who are fixated on intellectualism are very very scared of that that's why they try to suppress sex that's why they try to oppress women or the feminine in any form in society you see what's going on is that people think that they can think their way to enlightenment and you just can't you can't it's not within your power to achieve enlightenment otherwise everybody would attain it immediately as soon as they hear about it oh be oh yeah of course i got it right and some people pretend like that and they have a good spiel you know they have <laughs> they have a good talk they can speak the words that are you're supposed to say when you're enlightened right but the one thing they can't do is change their consciousness the consciousness changes it changes every day from sleep to waking uh from waking to dreaming from dreaming to deep sleep and then back again nobody can do anything about that either <laughs> if you try not to eat if you try not to sleep if you try not to breathe you just injure your body you have to go along with the dictates with the needs of the body and those are not set by us they are set by karma and karma is controlled by shakti so this is where devotion comes in the one thing we can do is generate good karma and the most powerful way to generate good karma is by devotion devotional service to the supreme in whatever form we imagine it so that could be a god a goddess that could be the self brahman in which case it's called ananya bhakti but even in dualistic bhakti the effect is still there and 
I have to give as evidence my Adi Guru, Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. Srila Prabhupada was absolutely enlightened. There was no doubt about it. He demonstrated in every day all the symptoms of a fully enlightened being. As one devotee put it, he could eat more, eat less, sleep less, work more, <laughs> knew more, could see right through you and know your, your inner thoughts and so on and so forth. He was tremendously powerful. Yes, he had one of the Pancha Mahapurusha yogas in his birth chart. But on top of that, you know, so do a lot of other mundane, powerful people. But he was also enlightened. How do I know that? Well, I spent 25 years of my life serving him. <laughs> so how did he become enlightened? Because what he was teaching was dualistic bhakti in a path, actually a non-Vedic path. <laughs> so how did he become enlightened? Well, it was by the grace of his father. When Prabhupada was young, every day, every single day, his father would invite a sannyasi for lunch. It didn't matter what kind of sannyasi. Every kind of sannyasi there is. The Vaishnava sannyasis, the Shaivite sannyasis, the Shankarite sannyasis, even some Buddhist monks he invited. Huh? <laughs> Tantric sannyasis, all kinds of sannyasis came to that house. And after the lunch, the father would prostrate in front of the sannyasi and beg him, please, bless my son that he becomes a great devotee of Radharani. Now, who is Radharani? Well, when you see Krishna, there's a girl with Krishna, that's Radharani. And it corresponds to Shiva and Shakti. So Radharani is the Shakti of Krishna. So if we accept that Krishna is God, if we're a devotee of Krishna, then it is Radharani who decides who is ready for liberation and who grants that liberation when they're qualified. So by the grace of his father, Srila Prabhupada became qualified karmically by worship of Radharani his whole life by praying to Radharani and by propagating the mantra, Hare Krishna, Hara, Hare is the vocative of Hara, which can either refer to Shiva or to Radha. So by worshiping Radha his whole life, he gained the karma to receive the blessing of enlightenment from her as Shakti, because Shakti is present in everybody. She knows everything about you, about me. <laughs> and she loves us because she's our mother. So this Shakti doesn't give the higher levels of knowledge to those who are unprepared. A good example is the stupid people who think they can force the arising of Kundalini. And it's well known, huh? ever since that book by Gopi Krishna, <laughs> it's well known that forcing the Kundalini results in tremendous distress and suffering. But why is that so? Because she is not a mechanical thing or an animal that can be forced. She is super intelligent, super aware way beyond human level of intelligence and awareness. She knows when it's time for Kundalini to rise. And when it's right, she'll make it happen. This is what happened to me. I'm speaking from my own experience now. As I said, I served Prabhupada. I chanted the Hare Krishna mantra. I worshiped Radharani, literally in the temple, for years. I was a trained pujari, 
and I traveled around doing kirtan of the mantra and doing puja of Radha and Krishna. And you notice the way it's always said, Radha Krishna. You know, not Krishna Radha. Radha Radha is more important than Krishna because she is the one who grants bhakti. She is the one who grants liberation. And devotion to her is the cause of enlightenment. In any form, Radharani or Shiva Shakti, you know, Uma or Durga or Saraswati or Lakshmi or any of the forms of Shakti, Kundalini, huh? if you simply worship her with love, she gives the enlightenment when your bhakti is mature. Even if you worship the self, Brahman, by Ananya Bhakti. When your Ananya Bhakti is mature, she will give deliberation. This is my experience and the experience of so many other sages. But it's hard to talk about because people are so biased, so prejudiced. They think that enlightenment is something they can do. Well, the only thing you can do is try to qualify yourself for it. And that means generating lots and lots of good karma. This is why we stress that before you attempt meditation, you have to have a foundation of karma yoga and bhakti yoga, well formed and built up over years. Then when you sit down to meditate, I mean, this is what happened to me. After doing bhakti for 25 years, I finally got around to sitting down and meditating, and within six weeks, I had Brahma Gyan. Now, part of the cause of this is the bad translations, where Jnana is translated as knowledge. Jnana is not exactly knowledge. Knowledge means stuff that you can learn from books, words and symbols. But we're not talking about that kind of knowledge. Jnana means direct perception of the absolute. This direct perception is not something you can make happen. It's not something you can force. It can only be a blessing from a higher authority. Now, there are lots of phony jnanis who want to tell you that you can do something you can do. You can come to my workshops and pay me a lot of money and I'll, you know, wave my hands mystically and zap you and you'll attain enlightenment, except that it doesn't happen. What happens is that you simply empty your wallet. <laughs> the real thing is you go to a guru and the guru engages you in service, in menial service. You clean the guru's house. You cook for the guru. You serve the guru. You wash his clothes. Because the guru is the external embodiment of Shakti, the mother. The guru is not the father principle. Guru is a mother principle. In the Lalita Sahasranama, one of the namas is that she is the form of the guru. She is even the form of Shiva. <laughs> so she's the form of Shiva. She's the form of the Guru as well. So by worshiping the Guru, you're worshiping her. And by worshiping her, you accrue the karma that leads to enlightenment. There is no other way. No other way. No other way. Not through knowledge, not through power, not through material opulences, not through learning. Huh? People have a lust for knowledge, but this is like being attracted to cities. It only leads to grief and trouble. Do the rituals of karma yoga. Do the bhakti. Huh? Develop love for God or goddess in any form. And this will bring you to enlightenment so much faster than studying arcane books and doing all kinds of meditation that you're not qualified for. This is the secret, and this is how you gain enlightenment. Aung Tatsa, Aung Shakti Aung.